My name is Ben Ayers. I'm Dean of the Terry College of Business, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Terry Third Thursday. This obviously is our monthly event, a great time of networking for some current students, alumni, and other business leaders in the Atlanta area. Um, I'd like to take this time to thank our alumni board for organizing today's event as well as this series. Uh, it's also my pleasure to thank our sponsors, our corporate sponsor, Synovus. Please join me in thanking them. As well as our two media sponsors, the Atlanta Business Chronicle and WABE, Atlanta Public Broadcasting. Please join me in thanking them as well. Our upcoming programs uh, in the next couple of months, in September, we'll have Mark Lazarus, who is chairman of NBC Broadcasting and Sports. Uh, October 18th, we'll have Griff Lynch, who's executive director of the Georgia Ports Authority. And then on November 15th, we'll have Alan Masaryk, who is the CEO of Vonage. And I hope that each of you will join us for those events coming up. Uh, it has been a busy week and couple of weeks for us uh, at the Terry College. Classes began this Monday in Athens, and so uh, if you've been to Athens this week, there is a lot, a lot of energy. Um, we also uh, have sent out a couple of news flashes the last couple of weeks. I wanted to mention those. Uh, this past fiscal year, we wrapped up uh, and had our best year ever in terms of fundraising. We raised $31.6 million. We had over 5,000 alumni and friends of the college that uh, made very generous gifts to the Terry College, and that impact will have a transformational impact on the Terry College, our programs, our students, and really build a very strong foundation for what we're currently doing as well as in the future. So I'd like to thank each of you for your support of the Terry College of us having a record year. This past week, we also announced that uh, our Toll School of Accounting won a national championship in CPA pass rates. Uh, so <laughs> we were ranked number one <laughs> in CPA pass rates among la large programs. And if you include really, really tiny programs, we were number three. And so uh, it's always great to celebrate a national championship. We hope that this is only one of those that we'll celebrate uh, this coming year uh, on campus. But it was uh, great to acknowledge that and the success of our new alums from the Terry College and the Toll School. I'd like to call Rob Garcia to the podium, podium now. Rob is the North Georgia Division CEO of Synovus, and he will introduce this morning's speaker. Uh, Synovus has been a long-term sponsor of this series, and we so appreciate their support. Rob? Thank you, Dean Ayers. It is a, a pleasure and, and, and an honor to be here today and certainly part of this great program. We've been a sponsor with uh, Terry College of Business for uh, several years and, and have always uh, looked at that relationship very fondly and look forward to continuing it going forward. I'm, uh, I'm particularly excited today to uh, introduce uh, a, a good friend and, and certainly a difference maker in our community, Mike Plant. Uh, those of you who know Mike, he has been with the Braves for 15 seasons. I love the way his bio begins. It sounds like a starting pitcher here. He's been with the Braves 15 seasons, uh, and in 2018 was named President and CEO of the Braves Development Organization. Um, obviously, uh, his legacy in, in baseball goes a long, long way, certainly in, in sports marketing. He was with Turner for many, many, many years and in many leadership positions. Started off as an Olympic athlete. He was on the uh, world speed skating team in Lake Placid, the Olympic speed skating team. So the sports stuff has come to him, honestly. But really what he's done in the business community and how he's meld those two things together in our market is, is clearly a story, uh, probably one of the greatest success stories in our region that is still being written. And, and I'm honored to be a, a, a business partner uh, with Mike and, and the Braves organization. I have the luxury of looking outside my window every morning uh, in our new Synovus building and looking at that Braves stadium as a reminder of what can happen. Uh, it was just a few years ago when the, all of this was just a concept and a thought, and I, and I sometimes pinch myself as I look outside the window and realize what can happen when a community and a business community come together. And uh, the impact that the Braves have had to the Cumberland area, and I think really to the whole metro Atlanta area, is phenomenal. And I'm not going to let 
I'm not going to, Mike's going to talk a lot, about, a lot about that, but I can assure you that it is just the beginning of about what's going to happen in our community. So I'm, I'm really excited to introduce uh, Mike Plant of the, the Atlanta Braves. And Ben, my daughter just graduated from the Terry College with uh, Lucy and Will and, and a couple others here, so I appreciate all the things that you guys do to certainly give our, our kids a great education there. So she's on her path and soon off the payroll. <laughs> so it's good. <coughs> um, I'm going to give you a little you know, insight. And, and as I was looking at that, I was like, OK, which one of these decks did they send to you? So I'm uh, pretty good at winging this. And as Rob said, uh, is it was a really bold vision that started really many years ago uh, when I started with the Braves in 2003. You know, recognizing the great uh, Turner Field, tons of great memories down there, history of our team, and, and a lot of uh, achievements in that. But uh, and I was part of the Olympic Games. I, I was on the board with Billy in 1988. Met Billy Payne. Didn't know how to spell the word Olympic in that. And so he obviously has a great legacy there. But that that um, the uh, the stadium after the Olympic Games is one of the great examples of how to take an Olympic venue and then turn it into something else and create a create a legacy. So. Uh, but the one, you know, the one thing that was always missing there was how to create a destination. And for about eight years, we, we tried to do that. We wanted to create that lifestyle change there. Knew what we were doing, 81, hopefully 91 games a, a year, most years. Uh, but it was, there was nothing to draw you there beyond that. And it got to a point where, you know, I knew you, you were grabbing your flak jacket and running to your cars at night. And it just was not the type of environment that we knew was conducive to this vision of creating that destination. So uh, we tried, and we probably could have found a way to make something happen there. But that takes two willing parties in uh, the public-private side. Um, I might repeat myself later, but I, I believe, as I stand here right now, um, that this will go down as the greatest public-private partnership in sports and entertainment history. And so uh, there's nothing else like it. The numbers you're going to see in a couple weeks are coming out. Uh, they're not conjecture anymore. They're not feasibility studies saying maybe this happens, maybe this kind of jobs and this kind of tax revenue. We're churning that economy up there, and I think Rob would certainly agree. And so, um, and the numbers are just going to prove that up because the numbers don't lie anymore. They're, they are the actual factual numbers. So um, I'll, I'll whip through this pretty quick. Everyone been there? I hope so. Yeah, great. It's, you know, we were fortunate that this piece of property, when, when you're doing something like uh, building a ballpark or a professional stadium and then you create that destination you need some land and um, I was reliving this story to somebody last night that actually uh, was they bought the two white buildings they were, had them under contract uh, that were right across from us in circle 75 uh, Hugh Scott and he told me how it, his negotiation with Mr. Saul 82 year old man in, uh, in uh, Baltimore that had owned that property since the late 60s early 70s obviously had low basis in it went on for six or seven months. I actually had a backup offer because I was trying to buy everything around there. But to have a piece of property like that available was very unique. And one of the reasons that for, for many, many decades people tried to buy that property or had an interest in buying the property, but what they quickly found out, and I found this out two weeks in that, into this process, the, hey, by the way, you know there are three gas pipelines that run right through the middle of that. And I said, what do you mean gas pipelines? Like gas, gas, gasoline, gas, and they said, "Oh yeah, they're pumping petroleum products 24/7 from Houston to New Jersey, two of them." And that was one of like, "Damn, didn't know that." <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's why that 50, the main 60 acres is available. So, um, so anyways, you know, along that quick process, um, dealing with Mr. Saul, I, I mean, from the first time we knew he was the owner um, to the time that I finally. Uh, said, okay, this is the number I'll agree to, I think was about a total of about 10 days. And so that's how quick this thing moved. But again, that, that was critical to us. And it was critical to us. Second. In this, this, is, this told a story. And I think a lot of you saw what we called our heat map. So in the lower uh, right-hand corner there, you see the difference. SunTrust Park, Turner Field is 12 miles apart. A lot of times you're reading today that, you know, teams are looking at downtown stadiums, downtown environments and that, and, you know, that works really well in a lot of cities around America. For us, the majority of our fan base lived outside the perimeter or near the perimeter. They lived north of Atlanta. 
I live in Peachtree City, so I don't, I don't live north of Atlanta, but um, we all know there's a lot of traffic in Atlanta. We're all, you know, saying our prayers in the morning as you don't cuss before 8 o'clock. Um, and so, so, you know, that, that told a big story to us. How do, we, how do we build or get closer to our core fan base or the majority of our fan base? Fortunately, we've got uh, fans, as you can see up in the top corner, all over the southeast, Braves country, six states. We don't have a lot of competition in the baseball space. So Braves country does drive from all those outer, outer markets. 23% of our fan base comes from outside the state of Georgia. No team in professional sports, not a single one comes close to that. <clears throat> and that is, you know, give Ted a lot of credit. He created that environment way back in the 70s when he bought the team, of creating a lot of interest in our team. But out of state, <clears throat> once again, a lot of, lot of uh, traffic, and we drive a lot of interest. But that told a big story to us, saying moving outside the perimeter or at the perimeter made a lot of sense for us. Um, I'm going to go backwards. I made a presentation to Ted Turner like two weeks into my job with him in 1995. And um, it was about, I was the president of the Goodwill Games, came in, I was blowing the whole thing up. And, and um, it was all on a laptop then, you didn't have fancy remotes. And so they said, look, when you want to go forward, just push that button. I said, okay, I can do that. I'll go over and push a button. I was showing him the slides. <coughs> and all of a sudden he said to me, he said, hey, can you go backwards a couple slides? And I looked at that thing, I was like, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> and I'm sure he's thinking, well, this guy's a real dope. <laughs> um, anyway, so back to this slide. Two things, the day we made this announcement kind of shocked Atlanta, it reminded me about the Olympic Games that I've been part of. Korea was my 19th. Um, same, similar reaction. Money and traffic. Everywhere around the world, those are the two things that come to mind when, you, when you're looking at bidding or hosting the Olympic Games. And, and that's what very quickly we knew was going to happen. And so, you know, I always said, look, we're not going to take our problems downtown and move them up to up 12 miles up to uh, the north part of Atlanta. The number one reason why people didn't come to more games year in and year out was they were not going to fight the traffic. They were not going to deal with the lack of access. When we were sold out at Turner Field, we were six to 7,000 parking spaces light. I, you know, I'm sure some of you, don't raise your hand because I'll apologize in advance, but I'm sure some of you drove around there mindlessly looking for a place to park and then, you know, I'd get the nasty gram saying, screw you guys, I just went home, you know. And, and so we knew all those things and that we weren't going to take those problems up the road. And then we all, you know, we looked at, t in today's world, it, it's, it's I, I don't like all the technology. I know how to use that phone pretty well, but that's about the stretch of it. Um, but use technology, use data to plan and execute. And one of the things obviously we did is to look at that data on those roads. And, and very, very quickly, I felt comfortable that if we created better access, if we created better pedestrian movement, we had more parking, 14 access points, we've got 6,000 more parking spaces up there with 9,000 less seats, that that environment was going to be a lot better. And then one of the big things was move our game time. Now, the players don't like it, and I've always said, said to all of them, hey, look, I, you don't think I want to get home earlier? I want to get home earlier, too. It was 1 o'clock last night again, you know. So, but it, it was just the difference between a 7.10 start and a 7.30 start. You start looking at the loads on these roads, and, and they start moving, you know. So, um, so we, you know, we dealt with that three years. You're going to ruin my life, doom and gloom. If you talk to the, the, the people who live in the building right across from us, in Circle 75, the tenants, just about every person I've heard from has said, we love it and wish that the Braves would play every single day of the year because we get out of these lots a lot quicker when you have games because we have police directing traffic and making sure that things move. So unfortunately, I don't want to play every year or every day of the year. You know, this is a little bit of our, our, our site plan, obviously, that main 57 acres. As I said, pipelines went right through the middle of this. That took, um, that took six months and $14.5 million to move those. There were two quick meetings. Um, again, getting people to sign NDAs because we weren't sure what we were going to be able to do, if we were going to be able to pull this public par par private partnership off. And um, one of them was with Colonial. They had two of the big pipelines, 48 inches, 36 inches, pumping petroleum products 24-7. Amazing thing to me is 
Houston, New Jersey, and in 24 hours they can change the product through that entire 1,100 miles. So it's a pretty cool system that they have. They're really expensive. So just to move that around the outside perimeters, which is where they now come in and, um, and, and reside today, was $14.5 million in six months. And so, um, but I went to Tim Cook, was the CEO then, and showed him what we're going to do after he signed an NDA. He fell off the chair. He was like, Does spring, are you going to do spring training here? Is minor league? You know, I was like, no, no. We're going to move that Big Mac Daddy there, and that's where we're going to start playing. And he was like, wow. I didn't know what Redco was when you came in, but this is, you know, that's something else. And he said, um, yes, my pipelines go right through the middle of that property, don't they? And I said, yes, sir, they do. He said, guess you'd like me to move them, huh? And I said, yeah, that'd be really great if you could. <laughs> and he said, yeah, we can do that. You just got to pay for it. So it was one of the best, best uh, early meetings we had in the whole, the whole process. So a uh, little bit of our, our following. You know, we, once again, largest marketing territory in all of sports. Many of you are, are certainly, hopefully all of you are part of that. And uh, I give Ted Turner a lot of credit. I mean, Ted, once again, stuck that satellite up in the air. We called it the garbage can cover way back when. and said, this is how people are going to watch TV going forward. And he was, a, he was a game changer, obviously, and a great legacy. He'll be 80 years old um, this November. He wasn't happy with me when we made this move, but he's gotten over it a little bit. Um, he invited me to his birthday party this November, so I guess I, I made the cut still. But, you know, I, I said, look, I don't want to get into all the reasons why, and we tried, and it didn't work. But, um, again, I give him a ton of credit for having that, that large marketing territory and the following we have. So a little bit of, you know, we just, again, didn't do this in just some knee-jerk reaction, obviously. Um, you know, access was important. Obviously, infrastructure was important. But... You know, this vision of creating that destination took a ton of research and, and obviously um, a, a lot of understanding what that market was going to be. You saw a story yesterday in the paper, for example, you know, and, and um, I have to always put my filter on here when I talk about certain publication in town. Um, but, you know, we're doing extremely well. And if you've been out there, you see the energy out there and the activation out there. And it doesn't matter if we're playing games or not playing games. I mean, the, 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 um, the vision and uh, certainly what we've accomplished out there, and we're, you uh, hopefully saw in the last couple of weeks, we got another $300 million phase two that we're rolling out, and, and you don't bring another global company like ThyssenKrupp to a place like this if they don't feel comfortable about making that type of commitment. So things are going very well. We looked at, obviously, a lot of data. It just wasn't sticking our finger up in the air. I mean, data drove a lot of what we did. And that, that data can change. I mean, I said in that article, when we started this, women's fashion, obviously, was on the retail side, um, was where we thought, okay, let's focus on women's fashion because women like to come here in the day and, you know, going to go have a cup of coffee and then go shop and go to lunch. And, well, that's all changed. I mean, you know, I, I think that UPS man, he probably does it at all in many of your houses, dropping a box a day off at my house. One of those brown boxes with that black tape. She's laughing over there. <coughs> I mean, so, you know, it's just changing how we all shop. So we had to change with it, and, uh, and we did. But these are just some quick projections about, again, how significant that whole area where we moved was. Very affluent, looking at comparisons um, in, in the, uh, the market that we're in, the population and the average incomes of, of where we are in Cumberland. You know, who are we targeting, obviously? I mean, one of the great things about the profile up there is um, in the Cumberland area, it's the largest population growth of millennials. And, and again, what did they have up there? Um, they, they had some things, but not a lot of drivers for them. So we're certainly creating that dri one of the drivers. I, I, by the end of this year, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable saying we will have three of the top ten grossing restaurants in all of Metro Atlanta in our second year. And that's just going to continue to grow. Um, my son, the, the youngest one, he goes to, uh, to KSU. He says, hey, look, Dad, we don't go to Buckhead anymore. We just, er, all of our friends up here, we just go to the Battery. And so um, that's becoming, you know, again, that destination. And I know they're there. I have an apartment that's right up on the sixth floor. And 2 o'clock in the morning on Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, I know those guys are still there. So <laughs> I wish they'd go home. I still, 
I have one of those little baby noise reduction things, so I listen to a lot of the, uh, the uh, rain in the, the rivers <laughs> every night. You know, future development, I mean, you look around the area, you know, Rob and Sonovas built a brand new, um, brand new op, Class A office building. There's been five since the day we made the announcement. Again, there was kind of the, hey, get up and run away from this. This is going to be really bad. This is going to ruin your life. Um, I had a lady once, again, I mean, get this gray hair. You work for a guy like Ted. I had a business partnership at 28 for three years with Donald Trump, so I worked for two guys that had zero filter in their life, obviously. <laughs> so my filter's starting to go, but I was in front of this group, you know, when you know, we spent a lot of time trying to get the facts out there, because if it's just what you read in the newspaper, you know, that's just not, I, know, I knew the facts. You know, my humor was reading some of the things I read in the newspaper, saying, wow, I'm in the middle of quarterbacking this whole thing, and where are they getting this from? But I spoke in front of this group, and this lady was just drilling me about 18 months out for our parking plan. And 18 months before we play our first game, a reminder of that, that, you know, we're still working on that. And you look, you'll, you got to relax a little bit. And she just kept at it in front of a groom full of people. And I said, ma'am, I said, where do you live? And she said, well, I live so-and-so. And I said, well, I'm getting used to Cobb a little bit. But that's about four or five miles from the, the, the stadium site, right? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, ma'am, you need to get some counseling or some medication. I mean, we are going to get a parking plan that's going to work, okay? So I'm not going to ruin your life four miles away. But that's what got put in people's mind was that, you know, this was just going to be really evil and there would be a half a million people coming at these games. We have 41,000 seats. That's 10,000 cars. There's 425,000 cars a day that travel on 285 and 75. So if you work it and, and you obviously you build a plan, you work with other key stakeholders, there's a way to make that work. But key to, you know, key to us is the future development around the entire site. And it's growing. I mean, Racetrack moved there. Snowbus built the building. There's four or 5,000 now today additional residential units there. So, you know, creating that destination, if you do it right and it has the right components to it, becomes very attractive to people. You know, just some key uh, drivers from, from a tourism standpoint. You know, we, we tell everyone, you know, 23% of that audience coming in, I mean, I, I love it when we play the Cubs, the Cardinals, the Dodgers. Um, the Giants, other teams, the Red Sox are coming in a couple of weeks that have a huge fan base around the Southeast because then this is their time instead of going to one of those, those outer markets to come and see their team. The key is, you know, have them spend a bunch of money here and beat the snot out of them. That's, that's the recipe <laughs> for success. And a couple last couple of years, we weren't really good at that. We're getting a lot better at it again. So, but, you know, we, we always make sure people understand we're part of Atlanta and we are constantly creating partnerships with other part of parts of Atlanta. You know, those, those folks, those visitors want to have things to do. There's great things to do in Cobb, but there's great things to do downtown. This wasn't about how do we separate ourselves out of Atlanta. We're the Atlanta Braves. We're part of this market, and we're going to continue to be part of the market. You know, our lineup, obviously, and this, is, this was phase one, and again, a, we felt a really good mix of that lifestyle destination. It's abused and overused, live, work, play. And, but that's what's happening out there. Uh, thousands of people that are working there, people that are living there. Uh, we, we activate the entire place year round, 81 games a year. We know we're doing hopefully 91 games again soon. The Roxy's got 50 concerts a year and about 30, 40 other events. You know, we had an ice rink out there last year and we're activating holidays and we've got Santa Claus there for I mean, we're driving people there. That's what we have to do when you create a, a true destination. Got a good, you know, mix of, um, of retail. This changed. I mean, as you look at that, again, the, if, that, if I would have showed you that four or five years ago, that had, had you know, anthropology on there and cosmetic shops and um, um, Ann Taylor and that. We were going, oh, yeah, we're going to go after those. Well, those businesses have changed a lot. Matter of fact, I'm sitting here today saying, thank God we didn't do those deals because you had to buy those deals, a ton of, you know, rent, abatements up front and a bunch of TI up front and it would have taken us probably three or four years to see a dollar in those and that's you know that's not how ladies are shopping today you're just it's it, it's it's different it's the retail experience is different so, you know so for us we're not a traditional developer I mean you know I'm I, I say that and I'm sitting here saying yeah you know most of the developers now say Mike you're in a development business and you're in a real estate business and we are 
But the big difference between us is that we're not sticking a square peg in a round hole and then selling this thing and moving on. We're here for at least 30 years. I won't be there for 30 years or something really went wrong. But um, th that's, that's the commitment we made to Cobb. And so we're vested, invested in that. We're vested in it. We've got, as I've said many times, we have at least a billion reasons why we're going to make this thing work. And a traditional developer doesn't have that long-term play. He's filling this thing up. He's going to flip this. He's going to move on. No disrespect to them, but that's, that's what they do for a business. That's not what we do for business. We're not, we're not looking for our next big development, obviously. This is it. And so we make different decisions. We're going to make good business decisions on the retail. We're now focused on experiential type of an opportunity. And more importantly, we've turned down a lot of guys that want to get in there. They just, it's not the right mix for us. So that's the one thing that article yesterday didn't want to address when I said I could have leased this whole thing up by now, could have done some bad deals, um, and could have just stuck some you know, people in there just say, oh, yeah, we've got some shops here. We're patient, we're strategic. And right now, we're really happy where we're going. Um, hotels, a lot of hotels in the market, but not enough. I mean, there's just more and more. Uh, I read something late last night that right now, we're over-indexing in this market more than anywhere else in, in uh, metro Atlanta. You know, why? Well, 23%. Those people have to obviously stay in hotels when they come to watch our games. We just announced another hotel, an A-loft that we're building, It'll go on our front door. But uh, hotels in five minutes made the decision to put $3 up on a hotel motel tax. It was a five-minute decision when they got presented. Could you help? Here's how you can help support debt service. Why? Because we're going to drive a couple hundred thousand room nights, uh, obviously yearly and on an annual basis now, into that community. The, uh, the Omni Hotel that we built is the number one in the market already. It's a leader in a whole bunch of categories, and we're seven months in. So it, it's working. Convention Center, you know, Rob, Jerry is the chairman of, chairman of it. You know, I believe Michelle's told me they're starting to see lift of people that are convention saying, hey, now, you know, we'll look at two, three nights here. You got some more hotels that accommodate people. You got more entertainment to accommodate our uh, convention here. So, you know, we're working closely with them, and uh, everyone's starting to see the benefit of that. Dining, as I said earlier, um, you know, it's a big part of this. People, fortunately, like to eat. It's part of your whole inter entertainment experience. <coughs> you know, one of the things that was key with all of these restaurants and retailers was parking. Again, doom and gloom, my life's over, where am I going to park? I mean, this was the hardest thing for us in these lease negotiations, different than any one of these other retail establishments because they're not next to a ballpark that plays 91 games and has 41,000 people in there. None of us are going to a retail establishment if you know going in access is bad and I'm going to have to park a quarter mile away to get, to get there. You're just not going to do it. So that is a key factor, and that's, you know, spent a lot of time with all these guys. We brought a lot of these guys into the, the mix. Um, and, you know, you look at Antico Pizza, great pizza. Gio took probably a good year to convince him that this was going to work for him. And I remember that first conversation, hey, Mike, he's, uh, they don't eat uh, pizza. They eat uh, hot, I mean, they're the hot dogs guys, you know. And I was like, no, they eat, they eat pizza too, you know. So, um, you know, he's going to do close to $5 million this year. That's pretty darn good for a pizza place. And it way over, over uh, anything else that he's got going. So. You know, entertainment, again, all part of it. How do you activate that space? The plaza, we spent a lot of money on that plaza, connecting the ballpark with the, the, the rest of the mixed use. Brought in a firm out of New York. Um, the, the difference of expertise and experience, Populous was the architect on the ballpark. Wakefield Beasley, uh, architect on our mixed use. Neither of them kind of understood how to connect it. So went out and found some other ex uh, expertise, obviously, with a group that created that central gathering place. And when you're out there for games, you see it, maybe not the Marlins, but you know, this weekend again. I mean, there's thousands of people out there. And we use that space. That's where the ice rink was and other events that we're, uh, we're certainly planning in the future to, to create that gathering space. And that's, so it's, it's obviously working well. And then the Roxy Theater, you know, it's about 60,000 square feet, about 4,000 um, 
4,000 uh, you know, fans that can watch concerts in there. We've done black tie dinners in there. So we've become a really great concert and, uh, and special event space. That's a partnership, I should have said, with Live Nation. Um, but again, you know, unique part of how Liberty operates. They buy companies, they acquire companies, and they let us run these things. You know, big fallacy. I can just shut it down right now. When you read every time in a newspaper that Liberty won't, <laughs> excuse me, won't let us do X, Y, and Z, they um, they let their executives run these businesses. And so, you know, no one at Liberty is telling us to go acquire this guy or get rid of that guy. These are decisions that we make. But Liberty owns Live Nation. I mean, we, we negotiated hard with Live Nation, and uh, I like to say we took blood out of them. Um, <laughs> but um, it was, you know, AEG is a very aggressive company in this space as well, and they were, it was right down the wire with who we were going to do business with. And then the residential. Um, 90, I think we're at 94 percent leased as of last week. And, you know, we are selling this piece. We are always going to sell this piece. From before we put a shovel in the ground, we um, I always said, look, I, you know, I have a unit there, but I don't, I don't want, you know, someone calling me up and telling me about their leaky faucet. That's what other people do. The difference, again, for us is we never lose control of the whole environment. Those residents that are paying those kind of rates, which are buckhead type rates, they expect that the environment that they've moved into to pay that money is going to still be the environment no matter who owns it. So I've, I've kind of said um, a number of times, this reminds me of, you know, you, you start a mortgage with one company and they sell it to another and you just send your check to somebody else. But they can be, con you know, the confidence they should have is we're not going anywhere. It doesn't matter who owns the residence. But the other thing is, is, you know, we're taking that money and now we've just announced phase two. So we're just, we're reinvesting that into continuing to grow the total property. But, you know, we're really happy with, obviously, how those got built, um, the, uh, the amenities there. And, you know, I'd highly encourage you to, if you want, looking for a, a second place to come and lay your head, take a look at them. They're, they're fantastic. Except at 2 o'clock in the morning some nights. <laughs> you know, merchandising, this, you know, this whole site plan, there were probably 35 different site plans. I mean, at first I wasn't sure. You know, even we can move the pipelines, but um, we were kind of working around all that. But merchandising plan is important. I mean, where you put things and, and strategically how they connect with each other and, and the flow of traffic, obviously, from when they get out of their car. So we spent a lot of time on, on a merchandising plan. And again, where you're parking cars and, you know, this whole site, there was, there was $105 million of just hardscape and, and, and subsurface infrastructure. Just, just before you could start going vertical there. So, um, again, we all learned a lot. I mean, and we were blowing and going. I mean, this is, we built two and a half million square feet of vertical space in 30 months. And as I asked the development community, oh, I don't know, it was about a year and a half ago, it was just before we opening, there's a room for about this many people. I said, look, I'm not going to take any offense to this, but raise your hand if you thought when you saw the pretty pictures, you know, three years ago, you walked out of there and said, man, there's no way those guys pull that off. And everyone did. And, and because I, I know most people couldn't pull this off. One, you have to have the money. And the money is important, obviously, but the timing of that is the key. No developer is going to put a shovel in the ground until they get 60% of their leases signed up. We're $300 million in the ground before we signed our first lease. And we had to because we had to play a game in April of 2017. And I told everyone that was part of this team, bring your A game every single day. This is going to be one of the hardest, most rewarding things you've ever done. But by the time we play that first game, all 14 of those cranes are going to be gone. And all that Georgia red clay, which we love, is not going to be flowing down the streets. Because if it was, knowing that we were going to sequence in the openings of 20% or so opening on opening day on the, on the mixed use over the next two years, finish all of it, you're not coming if there's Georgia red clay flowing down those streets. You're just going to be like, you know what, I'll wait till it's finished. You just, no one's going to want to deal with that. So that's why I was very aggressive. The land plan all had to work, and fortunately it did. 
little bit of office market, obviously, I mentioned before, tons of great, you know, partners. A number of those are obviously our, uh, our um, some of our sponsors and, and, you know, Rob, their bank has been a big, I think we're paying the bills every month, aren't we, on that debt? Okay, good. Been a great partner of ours. Yeah. <laughs> you know where to find us. Comcast, first single, um, Single entity lease, I think, it took an entire space in 20 years. So, and and that again just led to blowing and going, making different decisions. We, you know, we knew we were going to build this office building. We knew how much square footage it was going to be. And all of a sudden, they said, "We'll take the whole thing." And so we we're like, "Holy cow, we've got more office interest." So we built another uh, on a surface lot, another 92,000 square feet. Again, you got to be able to be quick, nimble. Got to be able to put source, you know, your capital quickly, and then add it into that merchandise and land plan. But um, this, obviously, building has been extremely popular. There's about 1,000 employees in there now. Technology, Comcast, there's no place in North America has uh, multi-terabit of speed. Hopefully, you've all experienced that when you go to the ballpark, the battery. I mean, it's, it's quick. It's working quick. They've got this place called The Farm on the second floor, a bunch of young, really smart people that come out of UGA and other places that um, they, they're developing technology and we're, the, we're the, the users for it. We're testing it, and so it's been a great partnership with them. I heard Mark is here. Yeah, Mark Lazar is my buddy, so Mark's going to be great. He's uh, chairman of NBC Sports, owned by Comcast. Hotels, I mentioned the Omni, just a market leader already, doing very, very well. And the last, uh, last two weeks ago, I mean, this, this was... Oh, well over a year in the making with Tiss and Cruff. I, you know, we all use them just about every day of our lives. They're an eight billion dollar uh, elevator company. They're they're a global company in steel and autos, elevators being one of the biggest, most profitable parts. And you know, again, when you're when you're in control of this and you have a vision and you have a strategy and you stay the course on that, you're in a different position than somebody that's just saying, hey, I'm a short-term player here and I don't really care what this ends up because I'm moving on. My first meeting with them, they said, yeah, we're going to build this, this big test tower and that. We're going to probably bring you know, about 50 jobs there. And I said, well, that's the non-starter. That's not going to happen. I said, I'm, we're going to build a really nice office complex on that, that great premier piece of land on 285. And so I said, so I'm, not just, I'm not interested. Move forward four months. And we kept saying no, but if you want to play, here's where you can, you can play at. And now this has turned into, this is a 600,000 square foot campus complex. We're going to build that office building. It's 300,000 square feet. They're going to take 150,000 square feet of that. There's a 140,000 square foot lab next to it. That's the base of that tower. It's 420 feet. <coughs> There's about 12 elevator shafts in there. They will test elevators obviously all their new technology top two floors will control a special event space be great places to host parties and do one of these breakfasts one morning because the views up there are going to be pretty good <laughs> and so um that that you know that took uh about a year to pull all that together and again the way we're churning the economy obviously on paper it's 863 brand new six-figure jobs that are actually coming into this market from all over the country. It'll be well north of 1,000. That, that's already, for example, you heard maybe that we announced, they announced, they're leasing another 80,000 square feet across 75. So they've already, and they're starting to move people in here next month. The, the beauty of this whole project that has not been, you know, really picked up too much is these guys will bring 10,000 people a minimum a year, visitors, clients, and technicians, and they stay three to five nights a visit. And so, again, for us, creating that destination, that's why very quickly we weren't building another hotel, and I was like, man, we needed to build another hotel. And so um, it, it's going to continue to churn that entire economy in there and, and create more and more of a great lifestyle destination. So we'll start breaking ground on that in 60 days. And then we just announced this last week. That's the A-Loft. It's retail on the bottom. Savi, the grocery store, if you've been there. We did a deal with Paul. You needed a grocery store. You got residents. Um, but it's not, you know, there's great grocery stores around there, obviously the bigger ones. But this takes care of our residential need. Got a Silver Spot movie theater on the front door, building a new parking uh, deck on the back in partnership with Encore, which is our part. They own the Doubletree. I tried to buy that hotel. 
before we made the announcement we were moving. And I, I, I signed the contract for $12 million. So I had the deal done. I don't want to own a hotel. I wanted to control parking. And, but I had this, the deal done. We had agreed to the price. And, you know, we had to make the announcement for all the various reasons after I went and ruined the mayor's day. Um, and so um, the guy was on a fishing boat, and he never signed the contract. And our guys were calling, hey, man, what, which, where is, when, how, when are you going to that, sign that contract back? And he said, well, he's out fishing in, I don't know, the Bahamas somewhere. I was like, don't worry, he'll, he'll get it. We made the announcement on that Monday. He comes back on Wednesday, and, of course, we get a call and say, hey, I think I'm going to keep it. <laughs> and I was like, of course you are. And he sold, <laughs> he sold the Encore for $2.5 million more six months later. And, but it's been great. They've been fantastic. Group out of Dallas. We did a deal to be able to build that parking deck, and now they're our partner in that ALF. And we don't run hotels. You know, they run hotels. So it's, it's, they've, been, they've been fantastic. But that's how these things can obviously work, and, and this one did. So that'll, we'll start going vertical on, uh, on that as well in about 60 days. And both of those should be done. Um, the hotel and theater and all that should be done sometime mid-20, and TK will be moving in in, in 21. That's it. I'm going to open it up to some questions, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of an oversight on our whole project. Um, I get asked a lot, would you ever do it again? And I'm like, nope, no <laughs> chance. Um, I'm starting to pay back my wife. Uh, and and uh, I'm going to Ireland on Sunday for five, six days, going to Italy next month. And so, because she said, look, you're, you said you were done in 17. And I said, yeah, I know, but then I got this other stuff kind of going here and you can't, you know, these are good deals. and. And more importantly, you know, look, I, I want to make sure you understand something. We are in the real estate and development business. We, we're really proud of the destination we created. Sure. Four years ago, that was Woods. And, and because we've put a team of people together um, that brought their A game every year, a lot of people, uh, every, every single day, their high standard of excellence. And then that public-private partnership, I've, I've said to people, you know, would you do it again? No, I wouldn't. But I also look at it, and we've had 100 teams from all over the world come through and see this, because this is the future of building any type of professional entertainment sports complex, college, I, mean, I don't care, it's creating, you know, you can't justify cost, and, and we wouldn't have, and I'd be standing up here, and um, this economic development report, the, the, the update's going to come out, and I, I, I guarantee you, you're going to be blown away by the numbers of how much we are putting into the system. I mean, I'm talking cash into the system directly from us and indirectly from us and how that's churning, helping to churn the economy. And so, you know, all the books have been written about professional sports teams or colleges, whatever, don't make the economy work. They are now going to get thrown out the window. Because if you do something like this, it's a great formula of, of what we don't expect from our government leaders is to run businesses like we all do, which is based on making good strategic, positive financial decisions to grow your business and, and have a return. I mean, that's what it is. I don't care if shareholders are in your own pocket. I mean, you got, you got to make it work. And this will go down as the, one of the greatest examples of that public-private partnership. Tim Lee one day deserves a statue out there. He's one of the few government leaders that said, I'm going to trust you guys. I, I get your vision, and more importantly, if we're, it, I'm not investing in a stadium. I'm investing in this that's going to churn this economy, and, um, and that's what it's doing. And, but I would tell you this, um, in this and personally why I'm still here, I mean, this is all fantastic, and we've loved it, and we're proud of it. Look, our team is about winning the World Series. That's what it's all about. Um, this all helps that, obviously, and, but, you know, we... We don't have a business that every year has to sit down and say, okay, what's, let's revise our strategic vision and our mission and our objectives and our goals, which many of you obviously have to do. We got one, win the World Series, and everything is really good. And it works out really well. So, um, so that I would just want to make sure you understand, we haven't lost sight of that. And we're going to do it again. I mean, this is last three years, they were tough, but we had to blow this thing up to get started again. And, you're starting to see if you know you're watching our team this year that the nucleus of these young kids they're part of our plan and then this off season we're going to add a couple pieces and i think we're going to get right back to the promised land again so it's going to be pretty good and this is just all going to be part of that uh supporting it so 
So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Um, it's been a good ride. It's good. We've got a long way to go. As I said, we're only in the second inning. Um, this next couple years will be uh, pretty intense again, less intense. I mean, 30 months, I mean, it just owned my life. And um, as I said, I'd never do it again, but we're all pretty proud of it. And, you know, we're, you know, Jerry and Rob are just two agree, great examples of the, the people at Cobb just embraced us from day one. And I don't know if they were BSing us in that, but they made us feel really good about <laughs> that's just their can do people. And, um, and that, that was really important to help make this work because as we were getting beat up in the media at times, these guys always had our back, and they were they were helping shore us up as we were in, in this venture. So, thought I'd open up to any questions. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, two questions: uh, the Tyson Krupp bu building. Yeah. In proximity of the stadium, could you go back to that picture? I want to try to get. Oh yeah, it. yeah. So, I call it the dirt pile. If you know where the dirt pile is, that we moved about six different times. Okay. But um, this is 285 right behind it. That's Circle 75. There's a Galleria sitting over here. So the bridge across 285 is right here. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So there's about a 4.8 acre piece of property that has a dirt pile next to the Hampton Inn on it right now. Second question is I'm a Terry student taking uh, negotiations right now. Could you give us an example of the most difficult negotiations discussion um, event in the 30 months? Mm. There were a lot. I'll tell you one of the funny ones, though. I don't, look, people ask me all the time, like, hey, what, what would you do all over? What are some of your regrets? What, my brain doesn't work that way. I, I, through my sports career and, you know, up until last year, I'd make 12 one-day trips to Europe doing Olympic business for the last 30 years. And I'd always laugh at my European friends because they love that word problem. They use it all day long. Well, the problem with this and the problem with that. And I don't, I don't look at it that way. I look at it just, hey, these are new opportunities and we're going to go after them. And look, I mean, you know, behind my back, they called me General Patton, and I was fine with that. Um, someone had to be decisive and make decisions every single minute of every single day. And I'm all about batting average. And you can't be Ted Williams in this game because you're going to be terrible. But you know, you're going to make some mistakes, but then they're just new opportunities to do something else. And if a team of people all believe in that, then you're fine. If you start doing this, you're going to, you're going to fail pretty quickly. Rob Taylor from Brassfield. Rob and Brassfield guys have been great. They were a big, big part of this. They're going to build Tiz and Krupp for us. So Rob and I are negotiating back and forth on the concrete for the ballpark. And um, this is going on for, you know, probably a good month because he was going to self off the concrete. And, you know, he's like, this is the lowest I can go, Mike. And I'm at this, I'm at, you know, we're not going to make any money. I love it when they say, we're not going to make any money on this, Mike. And <laughs> that was my great opening. He said, Rob, you got one big problem here, man. I said, I've been to your house. <laughs> he said, what? I said, I've been to your house, Rob. It's not a house. It's a complex. I said, you're going to do just fine, all right? So here's the number. Take it or leave it. I'm done, man. And I got up and started walking. Oh, okay, okay. You know, so, yeah, you got to play your cards, play your hand. It's, uh, it's just the same thing with buying this land. Where Mr. Saul is 82 years old, has zero basis in this land, and, you know, I didn't want to pay $600,000 an acre. The land's worth $2.5 bucks today an acre. So, um, but there was a pond there, and I didn't want to pay him for the pond. It's three acre pond, nice pond, but I don't want to pay him 600,000 acres for a pond. So I went back to this guy and I said, um, all right, here's my final number. And this, I'm done, okay? And I'm not going to pay him $600,000 for a three acre pond. And he said, okay, I'll deliver that. I said, what do you think he's going to say? This is to his president. <laughs> he said, uh, he's either going to take it or he's going to tell you to go pound sand and then you're not going to get another chance. I said, you really think so? You're not going to counter that? He said, no. That's not what an 82-year-old man does who has zero basis in the land. I said, all right, don't, don't tell him that. <laughs> <laughs> I said, let me think about this for a day or so, and I'll call you back. But don't deliver that message to him. I was up in my lake house having a beer by myself. <laughs> I called him back in 45 minutes because I was like, we need a big chunk of land, and that works with our heat map where all our people are. 
and I'm going to screw this up over $1.8 million. I said, hey, man, all right, I'm in for the number. <laughs> and we did the deal that night. So, yeah. But there were a lot of them. There were a lot of them. They were fun. Yeah. Yes? One thing I heard a statistic a couple of years ago, and I may not have this right, but they had compared some of the food costs of baseball stadiums. The what cost? Food costs. Food costs. And uh, how does, like Marlins was surprisingly one of the most expensive. I don't know if yeah. that's still accurate, but how does this compare? Yeah, so remember Ted, we opened um, Turner Field and it was the, the great opening of we were one of the few stadiums that didn't let you, or that still let you bring your own food and beverage in. No one does that anymore. We still do. But um, <laughs> Ted, I think, had, there was, someone said to him during this press conference, well, Ted, you know that bottle of water cost three bucks? He was like, three bucks? What a ripoff. <laughs> Something else. I always said, hey, man, Chipper just wants to get paid. I mean, I know we can buy this whole case for three dollars, but you know, it's, there's a lot of costs that go into it. I, I know I can represent the opinion of our entire organization. We're trying to do everything we can to not make this an issue anymore. Um, you know, so, so keeping that food and beverage cost, you know, you got labor and obviously cost of goods and all that. And unfortunately, like, we pay more, even with the volume, for our cost of goods than you can go into Costco. It's just the nature of how the, the, the entertainment space works. And so um, you can do things like the Falcons did a great thing of lowering some of the cost. They, they lowered, you know, you're not serving 16 ounce bottles, you're serving eight ounce bottles. And that. so there's ways to kind of play with that game a little bit. But we're creating a lot of value meals. We're creating, we're creating packages. We create premium clubs where everything's all inclusive. You know, one of the big differences that I know we're proud of 50,000 seats Turner, 41,000 seats SunTrust Park, but we had 340 premium seats at Turner, and we have 4,000 premium seats at Sun, uh, SunTrust Park. Those 4,000 premium seats include parking, better access, food and beverage at different levels, and if you've experienced SunTrust or Delta or Xfinity clubs, and you know we drove revenue there because we're providing value there. We still sell a $7 ticket at SunTrust Park. 55% of our fan base are families with kids. No one in baseball comes close to that. And we knew right out of the box, he couldn't, uh, you know, we couldn't price out our core fan base. We still had to make this affordable. And you know, we're cheaper than going to a movie. You can't even see your son play Little League Baseball, your daughter play softball or Little League Baseball for $7. So yeah, we're, we're cognizant of that. I'd love one day that this is all just baked into the ticket. Yes, sir. Mike, thanks for getting up so early and coming out here this morning. You bet. Uh, one of the shocking things when the announcement first came out was the decrease in seating. Yeah. So talk about that decision, and then since then we have seen other stadiums do similar things. And also, what is the what's the what's the future of a what's a baseball stadium going to look like in 20 years? Yeah. You know, I, I think first of all, we don't play 10 games or eight home games. We play 81 home games. I mean, this is an 11-game stretch we're in right now. So, you know, if you look at your, your core fan base, this isn't Boston, New York, or St. Louis, or the Cubs. The Cubs can be terrible year in and year out, and they still, they still sell out, you know. Um, and I don't say that because Atlanta doesn't have passion with sports fans like some of those knuckleheads write those articles. This is a very passionate community. There's a lot to do in this community. There's great college sports, there's all the professional sports, there's second tier professional sports, there's tons of entertainment options. Everyone only has so much money in their pocket, so you gotta compete in that entertainment space. If you look at 81 games a year, the wheelhouse we felt based on 20 years of data and knowing this market was around that 40,000 seat range. Sure, we sold out Turner Field at times, but used to drive us all nuts when we'd have a playoff game at 48 and a half thousand people. And they'd say, yeah, Atlanta didn't sell out again, bad sports town. So that's a big stadium in baseball at 50,000. So, um, and you know, just again, then measuring everything else around there in that mixed use environment, that was also part of that, what's the right wheelhouse for 
access parking, people getting in and out. And so um, and we, we think we made the right decision. It was a, it was a good one. Again, future, um, you know, we all learned from the last guy. I mean, we went and poached ideas from 20 other ballparks in Dallas and Indy on the football side. And so we're just all, and, and then, but then it's, it's taking that and making sure you don't become complacent. You know, I, I had a big thing when I started with the Braves saying, what are we doing every year to, to reintroduce a new roller coaster? Got to have a new roller coaster every year when you're in the theme park business. And what's our new roller coaster? Because the truth of the matter is about, I mean, it's okay, this year it's changed. You, know, ask, you all raise your hand. Yeah, you want to shout at the TV last night. Our fan base is getting pretty excited again. Number one um, highest rating on Fox was two nights ago in five, the last five years. So people are watching. And because we're winning. Winning is a great formula for interest. But um, probably 15% of our fan base is what you'd call an avid fan. The rest of them are those families, corporates, entertainment seekers. And so um, if you're not winning and that value proposition isn't working and you can't get access here and this place isn't clean and it doesn't feel safe and all those things that make it all work, you're going to go do something else. And, and we get that starts with winning, the rest of it all has to work as well. And so we've got to keep making sure we're paying attention to that over the next 20, 30 years. I won't do it. Someone else will. Yes, sir? Mentioning winning is a big part of it. Yeah. How did you guys, how are you guys affected and how is your strategy affected by not being, you know, a winning ball club when you guys were moving into the new stadium? Oh, it was terrible. How did terrible. you guys deal with that? No, it was... I mean, I, I remember the November meeting in 2014 where Hart and Copy were like, okay, we got to blow this whole thing up. And Schiller and I are like, okay, hold on a second here. We all know what we signed up for here. And we're going to go in the marketplace and we're going to say, hey, you're going to want to pay all these premium prices for all these great clubs and all that. And we're going we're gonna to stink. Um, you know, we, you know, some of the ticket sales guys would tell you they got the calls. And we're, they're doing all their dance and how great it was going to be and sending pictures. And then the first thing someone would say is, hey, are you guys ever going to win again? And, you know, it's hard to counter that. But <clears throat> you take your lumps. You, as, you know, you could, the thing we all understood and we all came to grips with and we all bought into is you can do what a lot of teams do is have a slow death in this game for six to eight painful years and then it's a slow rise up, and that could be 10 to 12 years, and you can just lop the head off the thing. I mean, look, Craig Kimball we loved, Simmons we loved. Simmons wins a gold glove, and a big announcement, and two weeks later he's off the reservation. You know, so it's, but you had to make those tough decisions. But as we sit here today, you can see it worked. Last in player development, now number one. These young kids are coming up. They're getting it done. Look at Smoltz, Maddox, you know, Chipper, all those guys. That's what got us there. So we lost our way a little bit. And as we sit here this offseason, my first time in this organization, we're going to be a player this offseason. We can't be, we can't make bad decisions, you know, which you can do in the free agent market. 20% of those guys end up being um, worth what you pay them. That means 80% is a bust. That's a bad average. So you got to be really smart about it. But we're going to be a player again. Yes, sir. There's been a lot of talk about Marta and the expansion of Marta. Can yeah. you comment on on rail? Is is rail a part of the vision for this in the near future? And if not, Marta is light rail a part of it? So, I'm not an expert to talk to you about, you know, steel. You know, wheel on steel. <clears throat> I met with Robbie Ash again last week. I would tell you the same thing we've said from day one, and I've said this openly to the the, the guys in Cobb. We can't make transportation, future transportation decisions on people that look like us. Now, I'm not using public transportation. I'm getting in my car because I, I, I can do that. I'm old. I'm just used to it. That's how I get around. I'm not saying that's right. When my wife and I, we have a home in Park City, we use a bus out there. It's great. It's, it's, it comes down the bottom of the hill. And so we've got to make it affordable. We've got to make it safe. We've got to make it you know, efficient. And, um, and we're big fans of that. And I think the leadership in Cobb is starting to see that that's the same type of, um, hopefully, strategy that they're starting to adopt as well. We're all for it, getting more cars off the roads while we've spent $30 million building bridges. 
and there's more of that that's going to continue to connect that Cumberland area, obviously, to get people off uh, the roads. I mean, I, I tell all of our staff, because we make them park on the outer parking lots and that, and you know, when I hear the squawking, I'm like, hey, man, a couple miles of exercise every day is pretty good for your heart, too. So, you know, not a bad thing. And if you're a fan, you drank too many beers, you need to walk. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we're, we're big fans of it. Yes. Complex and thank you because we love it. But at one time, as you've been talking about, it was just a vision. Yes. And getting all these different stakeholders behind your vision, what was like the key to uniting them into making this dream a reality? Well, um, you got to be pretty persuasive. <laughs> one, um, again, public-private partnership. I met with him before we made this announcement. He got it. These are smart people. He got it. They, you know, they saw what Dobbins did, for example, for Cobb 50 years ago. And, you know, they understood right away that, yeah, we all love the Braves, but we get this economic driver that can really be another huge lift to this, this part of the whole community. So it starts with having those partnerships. And because um, you don't have those with the key leaders and that, they don't buy into it and they're working behind you. And we see it all over the place in, uh, in America where you know, the Boston Olympic bid comes to mind. I mean, they just, they got derailed because they didn't have buy-in from some of the key leadership and that. And then, you know, you got to have the money. That helps. You got to be smart about it, obviously, with the money. Um, and then you just got to have a really strong conviction once you get that vision down. And I know I, I speak for everyone in our organization. We're, we, when, once we see that, that direction and that vision, we're gonna go make that happen. I, for me personally, I love it when someone says, you can't do that. It goes back to my athletic career, you know? And I built a business in China and in Russia, and you know, I heard it many, many times, you can't do that. And I was like, okay, here we go, buckle up. And then build a good team, gotta have good people, you know? build a good team and everyone's singing and I always tell people I don't play any instruments anymore I just gotta make sure the band sounds good so I saw one more yes oh sorry I guess I'm uh, Andrew Patillo first off thank you for coming I appreciate yeah. your meeting with us today um, question for you I guess in regards to the relationship with SunTrust Imagine uh, I worked in the sports industry for a few years earlier in my career, and now I work on the corporate side. So interested how that partnership has worked, maybe how negotiations happened early on, and how you're, I guess, collaboratively have worked together over the last several years, and, and ROI, how you're showing return on investment for, uh, for them in the partnership. Are you a shareholder in SunTrust? <laughs> You know, we, we started with the, um, the club we built behind home plate at Turner Field. That's how the SunTrust relationship really started. And, you know, they enjoyed that premium space and putting their name on it. And, and, um, and then, you know, obviously you have this grand vision and we're going to build a new ballpark. And, and we knew we were going to do a naming rights deal. And then you go back to the people you have a great working relationship first. And we actually had three different players that we were dancing with early on. And we saw them as obviously this, we had that great relationship, we had a great partnership. They understood the value of it, but they also understood we were gonna have to borrow a lot of money, you know? And so that all entered into it, although, you know, I always said, look, we, we've gotta keep these lines separate here. So, um, yeah, the naming rights partnership was one that, you know, Bill, if he was in the room and I, he said it publicly, it's just been beyond their wildest dreams. They, they entertain a lot of potential clients out there, obviously. But then we have, you know, we have like Rob's bank. I mean, they've syndicated a bunch of things uh, that of these vertical assets. I'm dancing with them right now, late last night. And it's fun, it's fun. Um, but they've been a great, great uh, banking institution, great naming rights partner for us, and we've turned into good friends too. Worked well for us, I believe Bill would tell you the same thing. Thank you very much, I appreciate it everybody. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you, Mike. I uh, really enjoyed the discussion today. Great example of vision and success and impact. 
On behalf of the Terry College, I'm going to present you this uh, sculpture who was uh, created by Laureate uh, uh, Eby, and it's oh, cool. our favorite colors, red and black. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Brad. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. Appreciate it. If we have not had the opportunity to pay for your parking yet, we would love to do so, so we can validate that on the way out. I hope that each of you will join us back here in September and that you have a great rest of the week. Uh, go dogs and go Braves. <laughs>